Welcome to the Classical Happy Hour. I'm your host, Martin Davids. This is the show where my guests and I talk about music while enjoying a tasty beverage. Then we try to play some music together. Today's guest is Mary Elizabeth Bowden. What's up, Mary? Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. So, for people that don't know you, uh, what are you doing for work these days? So, I do a variety of different things. Um, I'm based in Winchester, Virginia, where I teach at Shenandoah Conservatory. Um, I'm associate professor there. And um, outside of that, I tour as a soloist. Um, I think I had 12 concertos this year. It kind of was like a crazy year. Um, And I do a lot of commissioning of new concertos for trumpet and orchestra. And I'm also the founder of a brass quintet called Seraph Brass, which is a group uh, composed of all women brass musicians. And we just finished our 10th season. And it's a group that I started from the ground up. And we tour about 40 to 60 dates a year um, domestically and around the world. Um, So a lot of managing with that. Um, And then I like to do projects with string quartets. um, And I'm also dabbling in orchestral work that I used to do in my 20s. I still like to play an orchestra when I can. And I just like to do a variety of different things and travel. And I'm pretty nomadic. Cool. So uh, where'd you go to school? So I did my undergraduate degree at the Curtis Institute of Music and then grad school at the Yale School of Music. Um, were you, was your family musical? I mean, it's, you gotta be pretty hardcore to get into Curtis as an undergrad, right? Yeah, it's really competitive. There was only one trumpet spot. Um, and yeah, I think, I feel like I got lucky, but I also worked really hard. I think um, when I started, uh, my parents are not musicians. My dad's an electrician. My mom was a graphic designer. They're both retired now. Uh, but I have two older brothers who are two and three years older. And the oldest brother randomly came home one day and said that he wanted to play the trombone. So it's all his fault. <laughs> and so the next brother, who's a year younger than him, chose the horn. And then I'm the baby of the family, um, three years younger than the oldest. We're all very close in age. And I wanted to stay in the brass family, so I picked the trumpet. And we had the same brass teacher who would come to our house every Saturday and give us each like two hour long lessons every week. And then he would pick up my brothers and I and drive us to the Chicago Symphony and concerts around the area because we didn't, we weren't really exposed to classical music before that. So he really opened our ears and we just, we went to so many live performances when we were kids and, uh, and I just fell in love with it. I had a really strong work ethic from the beginning. I think it was a mixture of being teased by my older brothers by not being as good as as good (laughs) as them at the time and because they were older naturally. And I also did dance before that, but I was a very terrible dancer. So to not embarrass myself for shows as a little kid, I had to, I remember practicing all of the moves in the basement so I wouldn't embarrass myself. So I think by the time I started the trumpet, I had this understanding that I was going to be not great at it when I started and that I would have to work very hard for a long time and be patient. And, um, and so that work ethic, I think helped me just progress very quickly because I had that patience to just play, practice everything very, very slowly from like day one. Wow. Yeah. That's unusual. I mean, a lot of people get discouraged when they can't do things right away and they just quit. But you had such a mature attitude about it. Well, it's because I had all those years feeling em- embarrassed trying to do ballet. <laughs> I mean, ballet is definitely not for everyone. No, it wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, so do your brothers still play? They don't professionally, and they had a long break from playing. But this summer, I'm living with my brother, and we just read through some trios last week. And my brother had not played his trombone in like 15 years. And uh, so that was really fun. They still, it's kind of annoying that they can still make a good sound, even though they haven't played in 15, 20 years. So they're very, they were very talented and ha- have great ears for music and everything. So I think they're starting to get back into it a little bit just for fun. So we'll see where it goes for them. I think as professionals, we're, it's drilled into us that if we stop practicing, everything's going to drop off and we're going to be horrible. And it's not necessarily true. I think we're just afraid that it's going to be true. 
I mean, there's definitely a drop off, but it doesn't drop off to zero. Yeah, I think or it's like a... junior high band level. <laughs> It drops off pretty quickly for trumpets, but in my experience, uh, I dealt with an injury when I was 30. I was hit in the face with a frisbee. I was not playing frisbee. I was just walking to my car late at night, and it hit me like underneath my lip and like a red part. I still have a lump of scar tissue in my lip, so I had to take off a substantial amount of time for the first time ever. And so I, what I learned through that is that it doesn't for me. If I take more than like five days off, it doesn't matter. If I take two weeks off or a month, it's like the same amount of time to get back in shape as a trumpet player. Um, that's just what I find. I don't know if it's true for everybody, but that's usually if I take time off, it's like once I've, especially if it's been a week off, which I rarely do, then I know it's going to take like a month to get back in shape. And it probably would be the same if I just took two months off. Well, it's a good thing you've that attitude about progressing slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... What, how old were you when you started? I was 10 years old. Okay. So, but did you want to be a trumpeter at that point? Or did you think you were going to do something else? I think I was drawn to it pretty quickly. And I think around age 12, 13, I knew that that's what I wanted to do for my job. I didn't know what that would look like. But I knew it was like my main thing. So I was, I was drawn to it pretty quickly. And... Um, knew that I didn't want to do anything else. And so that caused me to drop out of eighth grade and I went directly into community college when I was 14 uh, because I wanted to be more efficient with the classes. Like you can get them done in a semester rather than a year. It's the same classes as high school. My parents helped out with this. And, uh, and so I was able to get my associate's degree when I was 16 and a half in high school transcripts through the community college. So then I had a year before Curtis to, I worked a customer service job full time. Uh, and then I practiced a lot for auditions. And I think that's what helped get me into Curtis, being really prepared. And then I was in the Chicago Youth Symphony. So I feel like having that experience as a kid working out in the real world and also getting that really well rounded college experience before going somewhere to somewhere like the Curtis Institute of Music was really, really good for me uh, because I already felt like a well rounded adult a little bit by the time I was age 18 when I had to live in my own apartment in Center City, Philadelphia and navigate the pressures of playing really well. There was like a lot of pressure at Curtis to just always sound good. Uh, there wasn't a lot of room to just have a bad day. Uh, I remember a couple of the bad days I have and they're like forever burned in my memory. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad I had that real life experience prior to attending such an intense school. And so I felt like a more well-rounded human at that point. That's so hardcore, though. You just skipped high school and went to community college? Yeah, I really hated school so much. I hated having to get up at 6 and go all day. And it felt really inefficient. And I just wanted to get out. I just did not want to be there. Wow. I begged my parents. I mean, please, I need to leave. You did a customer service job, like on a phone or... Like in person. It was a company in Chicago. I'm not sure if it still exists. It's called Harlem Furniture. Yeah. And uh, I think they're still around. Like I worked the customer service in person when people would come pick up the furniture. So I had to deal with customers in person. And um, and then some phone calls as well. There was a, I thought it was really fun at the time because there was so many weird things that would happen. Like people would try to tie like a giant couch to like a little convertible car and then you'd watch them drive down the highway and the couch fly off and you know it's it's it was it was a good learning experience to deal with people and learn how to speak to people and help them and uh skills that you don't learn just going to class and it made me a lot more grateful to play music because those jobs aren't super fun all the time obviously so no anytime there's a problem and there's that's probably at least once a day I was like many problems, but I kind of made a comedy skit out of it because it was just, there's a, there were so many funny stories that would happen. I bet. Wow. Yeah. Hopefully you had a good boss that like helped you learn how to deal with irate customers. Sometimes and sometimes not, but my favorite boss would always tell us that the customer is always wrong. (laughs) She made me laugh a lot. (laughs) (laughs) 
So tell me about like playing in the brass ensemble versus orchestra and solo playing. Uh, when you started out, like what did you see for yourself and how has the reality of it altered what you like and what you want to do with your career? So when I started my time at Curtis, I remember thinking that I really wanted to be a soloist, but I didn't know what that looked like. And the culture of the school at the time was very much the brass players to to make a meaningful career was to win a job, win an orchestral position. And that was very much like the culture at the school at the time. And so, you Is know... Is it not any, currently or... Um, Wait, what do you mean? It probably still is like that, isn't it? Probably, but I see a little bit more variety in what people are doing a little bit, you know, doing solo competitions and things like that. And I just didn't do any of that because, you know, I was sort of told, like, this is the path that you should go on if you want to make some money. And coming from a position where I had to, you know, start paying my own way once I was in Philadelphia, I was like, okay, I have to find a way to make a living so I can support myself. Uh, And so I thought, well, I guess I better win an orchestra job and being a soloist is probably too difficult or you probably need like a lot of finances to get things started which you which you do which is why I wasn't able to pursue that until I actually had uh, a a stream of revenue coming in from performing so my 20s was primarily just playing orchestral music I won a position with the Richmond Symphony right out of graduate school and that was a per service position so it was like a third of my income So I built on that, and I started teaching at Virginia Commonwealth University as an adjunct. And I also got this job with the Richmond Symphony that was an arts admin job. And I was able to get that because they wanted a musician to get that position and somebody who actually had office experience, which I had a lot of outside of music experience, working odd jobs here and there throughout the years. So that's working that position is what really opened my eyes to seeing, like, what soloists do and how management companies work. And I started thinking like, I really wanted to do this, but now I'm too old. That's what I thought at the time. And I don't have the experience, but I really want to try. So for some reason I decided to try and I started taking lessons with soloists around the world and going to some like trumpet camps uh, and just hearing different people play and kind of deciding what kind of repertoire do I want to start playing? How do I need to start changing my playing? So I can really build a repertoire that's interesting and have something interesting to offer. Um, When you're trying to book as a soloist, the market's very saturated. And being a trumpet player, that makes it even more difficult. And, uh, but I started from nothing, from scratch. Of course, I had a, I was happy with my playing. I just had to find repertoire and also improve the playing and find the pieces that I'm really drawn to. Like I made myself learn Brandenburg Concerto Number 2. And I was living in Naples, Florida at the time, and I formed a nonprofit where I could try out some of this new repertoire under my control of like hiring the players and getting a concert series to hire us to fund that opportunity. And um, I remember I spent my entire paycheck recording my first performance of Brandenburg Concerto Number no. Two with a video that looked really nice because I knew that that would that would likely result in more bookings. Rather than if I just saved the money, had no posting of it, I was like, well, my first one's not going to be perfect, but nothing's ever perfect. So I'm going to put myself out there. And sure enough, that video has resulted in, you know, a handful of really fun Brandenburg performances uh, across the country. Hopefully more it is one of my favorite pieces to play. And uh, so I've always had the kind of like an entrepreneurial mind with thinking about like, how can I make this project grow? Or if I want to play a program with string quartet I was able to tour with that for a couple of seasons uh all all across the country like 50 concerts and so I like to dream of concert ideas and bring them to life and I think the major vehicle for that is Seraph Brass which is the brass quintet that I formed 10 years ago and I feel like any situation that, that I'm in you have to be a chameleon and it's different and I think that for me playing in a lot of different situations helps me just become a better player all the time you know, I really do miss playing an orchestra when I get to play that once or twice a year and get to play something that's really full and you have to like pump out a lot of volume from the back of the orchestra that helps open up my sound for future solo gigs. And so I feel like everything helps each other where in my early 20s, I thought you just have to play an orchestra to be great at orchestra. And I felt like my skill set was not as versatile as it is now that I do a bunch of different things. So the whole thing of like, oh, you're going to spread yourself too thin. Like I don't 
for me, that's just doing one thing makes me very stagnant. I mean, it's all playing the trumpet. Yep. So when you were young, you wanted to be a soloist and then you didn't think you could. So you played in orchestras and stuff. And now that you're a soloist, do you like it? I mean, is it as cool as you thought it would be? It's fun. I mean, it's terrifying. I think it's, um, but the more you do something, the less terrifying it is. So the more performances that I have, I become more comfortable. Um, and I do find that it's really fun, especially playing the new commissions because it's sharing something new with an audience. Whereas if you perform something standard like the Haydn concerto, it's still super fun, but you know, there's this like, you know that people are wanting to maybe hear it a certain way or they've, they've heard it many times before. So there's that comparison thought in your mind where when I'm playing the new commissions, I'm sharing something completely new. And so that's super exciting for me and hearing how the audience reacts to this new repertoire. Um, I also find very interesting and it's just great to share new music and stretch the ability of the trumpet and also just build more repertoire that will hopefully become part of the standard repertoire. That's cool. Yeah. A lot of people have an idea of how the Haydn should go or, you know, they have their favorite record that they've heard a million times of their, some trumpeter. And if you play it, if you deviate from that, then they're probably like, what, what's happening? Right, yeah, there's a little bit of expectation there. But with, with new music, they don't know what's going to happen. And like you you could be the only one that knows that piece, right? Right, and that's pretty much how it is during like the first year or two of performing these pieces. And hopefully they'll get out there and more people will play them. Yeah, I hope you're getting awesome ones. I mean, I feel like some some new compositions seem like they're written for just one performance. <laughs> And I wish that wasn't the case, you know, and maybe less academic approaches would be better, you know, like a, a composition based on like writing something that sounds good or that the composer likes to hear or, you know, or that you like to play. I hope that's, you're getting some of that. Do So when you do these commissions, do you have any back and forth with the composers and say, you know, maybe we could edit this part or? Definitely a lot. And I'm very upfront with that, with the composers that I've worked with, because I've heard those horror stories of a piece being written that's barely playable, not fun for the performer, and the composer is not willing to make any changes. I've seen that happen. And so I wanted to avoid that completely and so with the composers that I've worked with um, what usually ends up happening is I perform the premiere and before that we've had a lot of back and forth because I want time to see if I can if something's really not happening I want to see if I can get there Um, but then if something's just just not going to work for me then we have a back and forth and I'll play it for them and they can get a sense of like if it's working or not Um, and then I play the premiere and usually after the premiere there's more changes made And there have been big changes made because the composer will hear it and be like, well, actually, I wanted a different ending. Um, Or I was like, this is not super fun to play. I almost felt like my face was going to fall off. Nobody wants that. Um, Or I I changed mutes every 10 seconds. Exactly. And I had like 15 mutes on the stage. And I thought I was going to like fall down, grabbing each one. And like everyone was stressed out, including the audience. Right. I've seen that. Yeah. I mean why just play the instrument you know so I really enjoyed that process of like letting the piece grow into something else and so now like I have like there's videos of the first premieres of Vivian Fung's concerto and Clarice Assad's and they're like like really different now um you know if you listen to them back and with the current album that I just released versus the premiere there's big changes and I haven't deleted those videos because I find it like, I hope that my listeners will listen to that and be like, Oh, this is how the commissioning process can be. It can now it's something that I'm hoping will become part of the standard repertoire. And we had a uh, piano reduction made of the Vivian Fung concerto. So hopefully students will play it and professionals can play it on recitals. That's how something becomes part of the standard rep is people not everyone gets to play with orchestra obviously so um hopefully we'll get that done for Clarice Assad's concerto too uh and so more people 
we'll play it um, because I just hope to change that landscape of what is considered standard repertoire. I see some soloists commissioning these big concertos that have like 25 percussion instruments and then you have to play all these weird, you know what I mean? And I think like things like that here in the States, it's, you know, I, I'm always thinking about how can we get something programmed? We want it to be artistically fulfilling, but at the same time, you know, we have to be mindful of the budgets here in the States with orchestras. And so with Clarice, Clarice's concerto, we decided to do string orchestra just so I had a piece to offer for some of those concerts where the budget's smaller, but they want to feature a trumpet soloist. And so um, I'm mindful of that as well, just to have a good balance of repertoire that I'm commissioning, that it's not all for like a gigantic orchestra. Yeah. I mean, also when it, you play a concerto, like you do want to hear the solo instrument. You don't want to hear like 5,000 other instruments here and there, you know, that's not what it's about. Um, Cool. So, uh, what kind of music are you really into? Is there any that you favor? Well, I have, again, it's kind of goes similar to how I live my life. It's just a wide variety of styles and eras. I feel like with classical music, I can't just listen to that as background music very much. I need to just be listening. Uh, I have running music that's different. It's a lot of um, popular music. Um, and then like, I have like driving music. I'll listen to like David Bowie is my favorite. I love the grunge era music with Pearl Jam and Nirvana. And then I, I there's some, some new stuff that I've really liked. Um, I do like Beyonce's new album and Billie Eilish's new album. So I'm, I'm kind of like right now I'm in a phase where I'm just like listening to a lot of playlists on Spotify and just like listening to a lot of stuff that I'm not familiar with and just trying to mix it up because I went through about a year of not listening to music and just listening to silence in the car. And I think it's because I had so many performances. I kind of had a schedule this year that was pretty much two or three seasons crammed into one uh, because I had a pretty big breakthrough in my solo career and said yes to everything. And then I had still had like 40 shows with Serif Brass and my full-time teaching gig. So it was a little insane. I kind of learned my limits this year. Everything went really well, but I felt like whenever I had a chance for silence, I would just have complete silence. So now that it's summer and I have a little bit more downtime, I've been doing more of the playlists and getting back into like just listening to music that's fun. Yeah, I had a moment where I thought, wow, I don't really listen to any of the music that I play. Do I even, why do I even play this music? But it's kind of like, that's your job music, you know? You don't want to be at, at work 24 hours a day and and if there's other things that you like why should you limit your listening to that just because that's what you do for a living so and of course I love all all kinds of pop music and rock and all that stuff's great and it doesn't make me uh, focus so hard and listen you know also I don't really care about intonation when I listen to pop music <laughs> as right. much. Yeah, <laughs> true. I had a weird experience with this, uh, like eighties music that I would like some song I really loved and I heard it again and I was like, wow, the whole like first, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hey cat. First verse, like really not in tune and I never cared. And no one else did either because this you can still hear this song on the radio. So that also made me reevaluate, like, why are we so uptight about everything? Okay, so if you didn't do the trumpet as your job, is there anything that you'd want to do besides customer service? No. Well, if I had to change right now and it was like literally anything that I wanted it to be, um, I have a pretty silly answer. Um... I would want to be one of those influencers who has a cat that they can go hiking with and they make like a lot of money on like just, like you know, in a backpack. Or yeah, on the there's leash? like these How pages that I follow. They, they like go hiking with their cat and the cat's just trained to go on the leash and can go hiking and, um, and they get all these like, um, endorsements and I think they make a lot of money on this stuff. It's kind of crazy. So I, I would want to be some kind of like influencer with, with my cat. 
my cat right now is kind of old. He still goes on walks. I take him on walks on his leash. And sometimes without the leash now because he's he's a little older now, so he doesn't like run off too much. Um, but I mean, basically any kind of job that would have travel would be really important to me because I have like a huge bucket list of places that I want to go. And I know that I'm going to be using my solo career and my brass quintet as vehicles to like go to these places. Like we're going to Jeju Island next year. It's like a place I really want to go to. So I found a brass festival there and we're going, we're going to Peru to Cusco and we'll go to, we'll do the touristy thing of Machu Picchu. I don't know nice. how it's going to be to play a show at like 11,000 feet. <clears throat> I haven't not thought about how to prepare for that. Um, but you know, so I think like any, any kind of career that could maintain that kind of lifestyle of being a nomad is what I would want. Like, I think the worst situation for me would be to work in the same city or town and have to do a nine to five every day and get very little vacation time. That would be very bad for me. If I'm like longer in a place longer than three weeks, I start to get very antsy. Yeah. A lot of people I've had on the show list travel as one of the top reasons that they like their job. And so what is it that you like about traveling besides like seeing new things? I think there's always like these extremely beautiful moments, you know, whether it's like a, a really interesting hike or just discovering something new about a city. Um, I remember in Istanbul, just seeing all the cats, you know, I see your cat here. I'm a, I'm a crazy cat lady. And so there's cats everywhere there. They're just like, the city takes care of the cats. And so there's cats everywhere, which I loved. So you just like discover like these new things that you would not discover otherwise. And just, you know, trying the cuisine of where you're at and just finding the unique things of the place, you know, even somewhere like North Dakota, we were like in this town in the middle of nowhere, North Dakota. And we drove by and I saw something in the corner of my eye that was like very green and yellow. And I was like, what is that? And it was like this like 40 foot tall sculpture of a turtle riding a snowmobile. I think it was, I can't remember which town in North Dakota it was, but we were like, what is that? That is really weird. And so we talked to the concert series and they were like, oh yeah, the town had a choice between spending the money on a public swimming pool or the world's largest sculpture of a turtle on a snowmobile. So I just like probably the only (laughs) probably. And so I feel like those are the moments that I love on tour. Like when you can have those inside jokes with the friends that you're touring with and just have these stories that bond you for life. And, uh, you wouldn't have those stories if you were just kind of in the same place. And I think growing up as a kid, you know, my dad, my mom and dad would take us on vacation for like one or two weeks each summer. And, we wouldn't fly. We never flew. We always drove. My dad had a, we had a Dodge Ram red van with like the inside of it was gutted. So we had like, we would just like be in the back playing and we would just drive across the country. We've been to like almost every state camping growing up as a kid. And so I think that those adventures were always my favorite part of the year, just to see new scenery and go hiking and just experience something different. And so I think that that's probably why I'm really drawn to like the new experiences and just trying to see as much of the world as possible. So, yeah. So you said after about three weeks in a place, you you get antsy when you travel, do you feel like something changes in yourself? I feel like I get very, um, I start to feel more inspired. Um, I'm a little bit more animated. Um, I feel like I have a routine when I travel that I feel like sometimes I get more sleep when I travel than when I'm like teaching, um, back at the conservatory. So I feel, and I feel like it just like energizes me. Like it gets me like to look forward to something. I look forward to the shows. I look forward to seeing the friends that I'm touring with. So it's very different. Sometimes when I'm going by myself as a concerto soloist, um, I always try to connect with people in the town that I'm playing, um, because I don't like to just do things alone. A lot of the time, you know, like I went, recently played with Anchorage Symphony and I reconnected with an old Chicagoland friend as a teenager who used to play the trumpet, who's now a meteorologist and I hadn't seen her since I was like 21 years old. So I hung out with her that week a lot and reconnected with her. So I'm always, I feel like I always find somebody in one of the weird places where I'm at to reconnect with. And, um, when I'm by myself, I have to really motivate myself to go out and do stuff. Um, so I'm very much 
drawn to connecting with people when I'm on the road for that. It just it makes a better experience. Like in Istanbul, I had a friend who's a Turkish trumpet player who just like walked me around the city for two days straight. And it's such a huge city that I feel like we saw everything like in a very condensed amount of time. But it was very cool to have that connection rather than just kind of wandering, wandering aimlessly by myself. Yeah. I feel like I have different versions of myself in the different places that I go regularly. Like I don't have to be whoever I wake up as here. If I'm somewhere else, I don't have to carry all that stuff. I can, but it seems like I have different stuff in the different places, different persona that I just step into. And it's pretty fun. Um, so, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but it seems like there there aren't that many women playing brass instruments and it's awesome to have one on the show uh why do you think it is that way and is that changing at all and what should it i think it's definitely changing um and i think it all comes to representation and what people see on stage when they're really young i know that when I was really young and seeing all these concerts around the Chicagoland area, I did notice that the brass chamber groups were mostly all male. And I just remember noticing that. I don't remember being like, oh, that's terrible. I just remember noticing that. And I was really lucky to have really strong female role models because my teacher, my very first teacher played the horn because he taught my all of us. And when I was 13, almost 14, he was like, it's time to switch you to a trumpet player but I really want you to study with a woman trumpet player. So he found um, an amazing trumpet player, Carrie Lee, who freelances in the Chicagoland area. And I studied with her and she was really tough on me and just very, um, very strong personality with strong ideas. So to have somebody like that in my life was really important, I think. And, uh, and so when I started my group, Serif Brass, I knew that I wanted to highlight women brass musicians because it wasn't something that I, saw on the stage very much and uh and that's 10 years ago and so what i've noticed throughout my time with this group we do a lot of educational shows and we visit a lot of universities and high schools and we're also very active on social media and there there have been some young women who have subbed in our group or joined the group uh and who have grown up being inspired by the group which makes me feel slightly old but I know I'm not uh but you know there is like a 20 year difference between me and our newest member um so it's uh inspiring to see that we have inspired women to pick up brass I noticed there's a lot of there's a lot more young women tuba players for instance who are like killing it and when I first started the group there was much less to choose from and now you know we we've had two three young women playing with us our newest core member is uh i think i'm not sure how old she is 25 26 um but like you know these young women coming up in that age group there's like a good number of really really talented players who sound amazing and so it's really exciting to see that that change happening um i just taught at domain forge and seven i i think the number was kind of like around like i think seven of the nine tuba students were women which i thought was really cool so that's like i'm seeing the change starting and uh and i also think there are a lot it's just you know women can tend to be overlooked and uh you know there's a lot of issues there but i think i'm starting to see the change and i think it's just going to continue to become with groups like serif brass being out there um and groups that highlight women primarily i think it's going to just help promote women brass players and hopefully inspire the next generation to keep picking up the instruments that are, that used to be perceived as mostly male dominated. Yeah. It seems like there's no reason women can't play brass instruments. Um, and you're also supporting female composers too. It sounds like. Yeah. We, we like to highlight, uh, women composers and underrepresented composers. We have a new album coming out next spring that highlights a variety of composers um, with some commissions, some co-commissions. 
and um, just trying to diversify the repertoire and highlight like a mix of repertoire. Uh, Serif Brass is a little different than other brass groups. I didn't want us to be like one thing, like, oh, we only play pops music or we only do a serious show. We're a mix of both. Basically, the programming is just music that we love. And so there's some classical favorites that we've had arranged. Like we always play the Prelude to the Holberg Suite as our introduction. And then we have a new piece that we're touring with by Jeff Scott that we commissioned directly from him, which is really cool. It's called Showcase. And so we're highlighting some new pieces too with some of the classical favorites. So it's kind of like a mishmash of like um, some classical favorites with some modern music. And when I'm programming for the season, I'm just like listening to the flow of the music rather than saying like, we only have to do this certain style. I like that because everyone wants to see people performing music that they actually like, not just like performing to tick a box, you know? And it's hard to be passionate about stuff when you're just doing it, you know, for some extra reason besides that it's kick-ass music. (laughs) Right. And there's lots of so much kick ass music. Um, Okay, so you said you just uh, did an album. Do you want to say anything about that? Sure. Uh, The album's called Storyteller, and it's released through a record label here in Chicago called Sadie Records, uh, run by Jim Jim Ginsburg. And it's all music with orchestra, and it's with the Chicago Youth Symphony, directed by Alan Tinkham. And it took a couple of years to complete. We had, you know, two of the consortiums with uh, Vivian Fung and Clarice Assad. And there's a new orchestral piece with trumpet by Rena Esmail. It's really beautiful. And I did a vocal arrangement, or Sarah Kirkham Snyder did an arrangement of her vocal piece that I trans- we had transcribed for flugelhorn and strings. There's also a new piece by Tyson Dason- Tyson Golston Davis, and uh, and also pieces that existed before but are in a new arrangement with orchestra by jim stevenson who's also chicago based and a good friend of mine he writes a lot of great music for trumpet and orchestra and so it's a nice mix of like new music and uh some stuff is a little bit more upbeat i mean there's a wide variety of styles i wouldn't say it's something that would be background music at all there's a lot of different styles and and moods and it's just it's been my passion project of showing the world the music that I really love and I'm just so excited to be bringing these new works to life and having an album of just all new repertoire Uh, my last album was all arrangements of popular classical tunes so this is kind of like a distinct contrast to that so everything's new music yes on the album and it's called storyteller yes so can you explain the title so the title comes from uh, one of Jim Stevenson's works called Storyteller, which he wrote about 11 years ago in uh, memory of Bud Herseth, who was principal trumpet of the Chicago Symphony for over 50 years. And so there's a lot of quotes to orchestral rep and just really telling his story. And it's a really beautiful piece that features both solo trumpet and a violin soloist. And Yvonne Lamb, who is a classmate and friend of mine from the Curtis Institute of Music, came and recorded with me with that and um, we thought the title storyteller was very fitting because all the pieces tell a different story Uh, Vivian Fung's concerto is a story uh, she met me and heard my story about you know the the career that I've crafted for myself where you know being not only a female brass player but also you know starting my career as a soloist late you know, when you start your solo career, like close to age 30, that's a little, that's a bit unconventional, I would say. And so I've been able to break down a lot of barriers with that and make a solo career for myself, despite the challenges and, you know, make a a touring brass quintet work into the group that it is now. And I've done all of this myself with, you know, most of it myself. And it's, it's really difficult and takes a lot of work and perseverance. And I'm glad I didn't stop and just, because now it's like my career is in a place where I think doors are really starting to open and I'm able to pursue projects that I'm really passionate about. And, uh, and so I think that that piece tells the story of that. So it's a very like 
there's a lot of rage in that piece, but also like a lot of fun and like a lot of mood changes. It's a really chaotic, chaotic piece, but it's super fun to play. And I think audiences also like have really um, reacted to that energy in a positive way. And then we have Rena Esmail's piece, uh, Rosa de Sal, which is very beautiful and just shows that lyricism of the trumpet. And um, another another piece by Sarah Kirkland Snyder uh, just shows the beauty of the flugelhorn and how I like to imitate the voice. So I feel like there's a lot of, when you listen to the album, every piece is like completely different. They're all different from each other in such a, a, a really interesting way that it just tells the story of like how I'm versatile as a human in my life and... Um, I'm not just like one thing, so to speak. Um, that sounds amazing. So that's on all the streaming platforms and yes, like, did you make CDs of it? There's physical CDs. Yes. Um, but you can find out on all the streaming platforms as well. Yeah. It's weird now. I I find that I try to sell CDs and people are like, I don't have a player. But people still buy them, especially the brass quintet shows. Like, we sell a lot of physical CDs, especially the Serif brass shows. People just want to have the physical album. They want you to sign it. And um, because I'm always surprised, I'm like, should we have more printed? And we always have to get more printed because we do sell a lot of CDs. And I'm surprised because I I don't even have a CD player in my car. So um, it's interesting to see that it's still pretty popular. And young people are buying CDs too. Maybe they just want to have that physical album. It's great. Um, do you have any advice for young musicians? I would say to stay curious and be willing to work really hard for a long time while staying curious. And I think that like um, it's easy to get really bogged down with comparing yourself on social media. Like I was thinking about young adults now having uh, social media you know, back in, like, I kind of am in in an age group where when I was in college, you know, we just had, like, MySpace, which wasn't music-related. It was just fun. And so we didn't have all this external pressure of seeing everything out in the world. There's almost, like, too much information. So I think my advice to young people is to, like, really make sure you're having healthy boundaries with that as you're growing. Like, some musicians who are students love to share on social media, but you don't have to. I would say, like, don't feel the pressure that it's too late for you, that you're running out of time because there's so much time and everybody has their own distinct path and everyone's path is different and it's not not right or wrong. You know, I was able to forge a solo career starting quite late where most people would say, you're too old, you can't do it. But it doesn't really matter if you have something interesting to, to say, you know, the door can open for you later or sooner or, you know, career paths are very... Uh, you know, open-ended. You know, I remember saying when I was a student at Curtis, I distinctly remember telling my parents, I will never, ever teach. And now teaching is so important to me. I love my studio. I love sharing knowledge of the trumpets and um, helping students find their paths and helping them improve. But like when I was like age 18 through 21, I was like, I have no interest in that. So I think just keeping an open mind that your path may go down a route that you didn't expect and kind of just like be open-minded to these things that might change in you as a person as you grow and learn you might be open to doing something completely different like I joke that I I have a broke trumpet I've played it in public twice for concerts you know and I think I could be really good at it and I, I know someday I'll put in the time and I'm open-minded to thinking like oh maybe I'll do that like later in my career or become like a broke trumpet expert um, so you, you just never know what's going to happen in the future where your interests might go. Cool. So do you have anything, uh, awesome coming up that you want to mention? Well, in addition to the album, um, I'm starting my next concerto consortium and the next concerto will be written by Jeff Scott, who is a composer. He was formerly the horn player in, in Amani wins. He just won a Grammy, uh, for one of his compositions. And so he's going to be writing the next trumpet concerto. And I'm super excited about that because I I love his music. It's probably going to be something really hard. Uh, So um, yeah, so we will be launching that um, and the bookings will start like the season after next. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that. And the album is obviously out on all streaming platforms. 
um, which I'm super excited to share. Yeah. Cool. Um, is there anything you want to ask me? Is there a piece that you've been dying to play your entire life that has not been programmed yet that you have not played yet? And what piece is that? I mean, my initial instinct is no. I I feel like I get to play so much awesome music. And the only thing that came to mind was this piece that I wrote recently. But it's going to get played in December. So, yeah. That's a great question, though. Yeah. Mine is Prokofiev Symphony Number no. 2. Yeah? yeah? You haven't had a chance to do it? Nobody programs it. It's like super ragey and aggressive. It's a, it's an amazing symphony. We used to listen to that. My brothers and I used to listen to that driving in our the Dodge Ram van as teenagers to youth orchestra rehearsal. And we would blast the first Rock movement out. as loud as possible. So if you haven't heard Prok- Prokofiev Symphony Number no. 2, just check out the first movement. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, well, you've sent it out to the universe now. Maybe that opportunity will come. Anyway, um, that was awesome. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show and rate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can get my arrangements on www.bachfor2.com. And we're going to take a little break and come back and play something. Sounds good.